morning. Uh, my idea today is to talk a little bit about Islam, political Islam, and a conversation I think we haven't had about the Muslim world. Now, the reason I think this is really important is because relations between the United States and the Muslim world have been generally not so good. It's also important because as democracy spreads in the Muslim world, as we see more empowered Muslim-majority countries, it is important for us to be able to understand what is happening in the Muslim world. And I think one of the reasons why we have difficulty understanding the Muslim world is because we don't understand Islam. Very often in popular media in the United States and in the West, Islam is portrayed as either too religious, it's in need of a reformation or a Martin Luther or something like that, or it's not really religious. It's a political ideology masquerading as a religion. And one of the reasons people have this presumption about Islam, this understanding of Islam, is because of the birth of Islam into the world. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a mental exercise. I was thinking about using slides, but then I realized that Americans have no idea what geography is anyway. Uh, so even if I give you a corner of the world, you still don't know if I'm talking about Middle Earth or what. <laughs> so why not just pretend? If you were to look at the Middle East in the year 610, well, firstly, that'd be weird because you'd be alive now, so it'd be very strange. Um, but maybe that's possible. If you look at the Middle East in, in the year 610, which is kind of a blank spot in our memory, we think Dark Ages is Europe. It's divided between two great powers, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. If you look at the Middle East in the year 710, the Persian Empire is gone, and the Eastern Roman Empire has lost over half its territory. In its place, there's a caliphate that rules from the city of Damascus in Syria and rules over a territory greater than Rome at its height from the south of France to modern India, which is a huge amount of territory. So where did this come from? And the common assumption is this birth of Islam was a military expansion. It was a political expansion. And therefore, Islam is inherently a religion of violence, a religion of the sword. But in the last few years, we've found some interesting things out about this expansion, which have challenged this simple view of Islam in the Muslim world. The first thing we found out is that the armies that came out of the Arabian Peninsula, which is called a jazeera, a peninsula, were very small. These weren't huge, massive conquering forces. Second thing we found through archaeology is that the number of Christian churches, frescoes, mosaics, expressions of religious life in the Middle East after the entrance of Islam politically into this region actually went up, which is counterintuitive. Third thing is, in the conquest of Spain, it turns out it wasn't really a Muslim conquest of Spain. It was a Muslim and Jewish conquest of Spain. And Jewish cities were founded and armed as part of this alliance, and the alliance lasted for several hundred years, such that when the last Muslim-ruled kingdom of Spain fell, the Jewish population was expelled, and the Muslim population was gradually expelled as well. And the fourth thing we found is that simultaneous to these military expansions, and there were military expansions, not trying to whitewash history, uh, were expansions by trade into India, Southeast Asia, and China, which were non-military, which were peaceful, which were mercantile. So this forces us to kind of rethink what was happening in this early period of Islamic history. And the way in which we should rethink it, and the way in which we should understand it, and the way in which we will find common ground between the early growth of Islam and the idea of America, in fact, is by understanding the figure of Muhammad. So Muhammad is seen by Muslims as the last in a line of prophets, which includes Abraham, Jesus, who is the Messiah, John the Baptist, and finally Muhammad. Right? This continuum of prophecy. And Muhammad is born in a society I like to describe as the Walking Dead. Right? If you've seen The Walking Dead, good for you. If you haven't seen it, you shouldn't be allowed to graduate from Columbia. <laughs> but I have no influence over that decision, thankfully, so it's OK. Arabia was a very difficult society to live in at the time. It was tribal. Your boundary of responsibility as a human being extended only to your tribe. Conversely, this also meant that your worth as an individual and your security as an individual came down to whether you had a tribe and how powerful your tribe was, what gender you were, and what economic class you belonged to. Right? There wasn't a concept of overarching human solidarity. Muhammad is born as someone without a father. His father dies before he's born. His mother dies when he's very young. He's an orphan. He's from a tribe that's kind of low on the hierarchy. And he lacks a patron. Right? In a tribal society, if you don't have a patron, there is no social security office you can go to to help you out. You simply do not matter. And Muhammad's religious mission is colored from the very beginning by this idea of marginalization. He's acutely aware of marginalization because he suffers it himself. And he understands 
that his followers, who early on are socially weak, marginal, generally they are slaves, they are women, they are poor, they are people without tribes or people from weak tribes, that they need protection. So very early on, he sends the weakest of his followers to Ethiopia. Again, if you don't know where Ethiopia is, I can't help you. Um, it's across the Red Sea uh, from Mecca, which is where Muhammad was born. Uh, I once gave a map quiz to my students here at Columbia, uh, and a number of them identified Israel with the Red Sea, uh, which indicates that nobody has any idea of what's going on. Um, many people thought Iran was located in Bulgaria. All of these things which really inspire confidence uh, in, in, in foreign policy and, and international relations. Uh, that said, um, everything I said was false. Muhammad sends his weakest followers to Ethiopia. And there they live under the rule of a Christian king, and that's the oldest continuously existing Muslim community in the world. Because this community is a minority inside a Christian kingdom, it kind of explodes our notion of what early Islam was. But Muhammad says, no, you should go there because you'll find protection. But eventually this isn't enough, and so he establishes a city-state 200 miles to the north of Mecca in a city that is now called Medina. Medina, awkwardly in Arabic, just means city. Uh, so it's just, you know, it's bare bones, simple marketing, right? You get what you have, right? That's it. And there, Muhammad dictates possibly the earliest constitution in world history. It's a constitution that says that the Muslim and Jewish communities of Medina constitute one ummah, and ummah is a word derived from the Arabic for mother, right? One tribe with mutual defensive obligations, but religious rights to their own traditions. Now, what Muhammad is essentially doing in Arabia is he's basically saying that the tribal structure needs to be replaced. He's trying to create a much larger sense of human belonging. And an interesting, very brief example of this concerns a man he met in Medina named Julebib. And Julebib was a man who had no tribe, had no lineage, existed totally on the margins. He didn't matter. And on one occasion when Muhammad was traveling with a caravan which included Julebib, the caravan was attacked. And once the battle was over, Muhammad gathered his followers and said, who has lost someone? And they named the people they had lost because they were still conditioned by this mentality that we should think of those who our tribe is responsible for, those who belong to us by bloodline, by lineage. But Muhammad kept insisting that I have lost someone and nobody realized who this person was until finally Muhammad himself had to say, I lost Julebib. Julebib was killed. But nobody claimed him because nobody had a sense of responsibility for him. And Muhammad himself takes it upon himself to bury Julebib, and he says as he's burying him, he is of me and I am of him. Meaning, in other words, that it doesn't matter who we are descended from, but we have obligations to each other. And so Muhammad's life is characterized by the sense that there needs to be social order to protect the weak. Where it exists, it should be taken advantage of and protected, and where it doesn't exist, it should be created and defended if necessary. And hence, the awkwardness we have when we see Muhammad and we say, how can a religious leader be a political leader? How can a religious leader be a general, right? This is part of the problem in understanding early Islam. Now, when Muhammad dies, you can think of it as an Abraham Lincoln moment. Because all of Arabia has become Muslim at this point. And when he dies, his closest companions and followers and family think to themselves, is this it? Is it over? This great experiment that has been constructed that allowed us to transcend tribe, to transcend these narrow identities, what happens now? And we can see in those four facts I mentioned at the beginning that early Muslims believed they had some kind of obligation to expand or grow or develop this kind of belonging, to extend it to others. And this is what explains in part how Arabs from a very small corner of Arabia found themselves within 100 years in all the different corners of the known world. Because there was a sense that their faith had given them a universal human perspective, and this would inspire them to go outwards beyond the bounds of culture, of language, of geography. The reason this is important, and I want to close with this, is because we have to understand the power of this idea to understand where political Islam comes from, why it is a big problem, but why it has the potency it does. America is a moral idea. Right? Most of us in this room probably are not descended from people who fought in the Revolutionary War. Yet we feel a sense of ownership over that struggle. 
We feel that the circle of belonging started by the Founding Fathers is meant to continue to grow outwards. Hence, we link the Revolutionary War to the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, and on and on and on, as a sort of fulfillment of a moral destiny. Muslims, similarly, see Islam as a vehicle for creating an ever-widening circle of human solidarity. Now, perversely and contradictorily, Political Islam inverses the, inverts the relationship and becomes a tribal identity when Muhammad was all about fighting tribalism. But the reason political Islam has resonance is because it builds on a common historical memory. Even if most Muslims had nothing to do with that period, genetically speaking, ethnically speaking, they feel a sense of ownership over it. And that sense of ownership is part of the reason why we have a difficulty understanding the Muslim world today. And I would end with this, that in the United States we identify the project, the constitution, the idea of America as a country as a means of creating and sustaining human solidarity. And in the Muslim world, Muhammad is understood as a divinely guided figure, a human being, who, not in spite of his belief in God, but because of his belief in God, is able to construct a society that transcends bounds of tribe and race and lineage and gender. And hence, it is through religion that one can find a more just society. And what this suggests at bottom is that there is a tremendous degree of overlap between the idea of America and the idea of Islam. And rather than see the two as opposed to each other, we can see the two as potentially and ideally mutually convergent. Thank you very much.